I'm very pleased to welcome the three panelists, Sabine Carey, Rika Schenweth, and, and Karl-Henning Krutzen. So I'd like you to come up and join me um, behind the desk here now. Um, so this first panel is uh, entitled The Bright Side of Democratization. Um, it will explore the idea that democratization is a partial cause of the human progress that the world has seen over the 20th and 21st century, uh, and aspects related to that. So um, I'm extraordinarily happy to introduce the members of this panel. Uh, all three of them have risen very swiftly to, internationally, to be internationally leading scholars in this field, and they bring together a fascinating set of complementary approaches and competences that promise a very stimulating exchange of ideas. All three of them have published so widely and prominently and received so many prizes and awards that it would be tedious to list them. So I'll just give you a brief introduction to the research. So first, uh, Sabine Carey is Professor of Political Science at the University of Mannheim and co-editor of the American Political Science Review. Sabine's research has been covering various aspects of repression and human rights violations. Her most recent research studies the role of pro-government militias and the escalation of political violence. She has also written extensively on the role of democratic political institutions and changes to them for repression and human rights violations. Erika Schenovet is Professor of Political Science and Associate Dean for Research at the Joseph Korbel School of International Studies at the University of Denver. Erika's research has focused on why state and non-state groups use political violence, what, is the what are the alternatives to political violence, and how can non-violent alternatives be promoted. In particular, her book on why civil resistance works is relevant to today's topic. As nonviolent popular movements are important not only for democratization itself, but also for how democracy works to bring out beneficial outcomes. Finally, Karl Henrik Knudsen is Professor of Political Science um, at the University of Oslo and co editor of Scandinavian Political Studies. Um, a large, he's also associated with the Viden project that. Um, uh, Stefan has introduced. A large share of Karl Hendrik's research is concentrating on analyzing how democratic political institutions impact outcomes of interest to us, in particular how democracy contributes to economic growth, income inequality, and property rights protection, as well as studying processes of democratization overall. So I'll introduce this panel by showing you a few slides to set the stage for its implicit claim that the bright sides of democratization are related to human progress. Um, Stefan has touched upon on some of these uh, ideas already, so, but I'll, some of these will be um, echoing some of, some of his claims. So very often in our research and media's coverage of events, we tend to focus on challenges, societal problems to solve, and negative changes to what we value. This focus is important, and all members of this panel are fully aware of the dark side of democratization the dark sides of the world in more general. Um, still, it's important to once in a while remind ourselves that humanity has experienced immense progress over the past decades and centuries. So to illustrate this, um, take a look at this graph. It shows the trend in global and country-wise infant mortality rates, which Stefan also mentioned, um, from 1960 to 2015. The bold black line here is the population-weighted global average of infant mortality rates. In 1960, about 120 or 1,000 live-born infants died before reaching the age of one year in, as a global average. In 2015, this value is well below 50. So the plot is on a log scale, so actually under-communicates the extent of this improvement. This reduction of about 60 to 70 percent has been nearly universal, although stark inequalities persist. The thin lines show the infant mortality rates for every country in the world. So the vast majority of them have improved at the same rate as the global average, and some spectacularly so, such as South Korea that's increased infant mortality rate by more than 95 percent over the, over the last 50 years. The exceptions to this pattern of improvement are relevant to our panel. The some of the very few countries that have not improved at all are Iraq, North Korea, and Zimbabwe. The next slide shows the number of people killed in war um, of, varied, of varied types from 1946 to 2016 in per capita terms. The vertical axis shows the number of people per 100,000 inhabitants globally that die from direct battle-related deaths. Wars also kill people indirectly, but these numbers follow the same trends. We also see an uneven pattern of human progress. The current wars in the Middle East that are going today, 
uh, approach the horrors of the Vietnam and Iran Iraq and Iran-Iraq wars, but the number of deaths in wars are very far from following the tripling of the global population over the last 70 years. Interstate wars have become very rare, and on average inter internal armed conflicts have become slightly less lethal, although they still are very common. Another improvement of great importance is the expansion of education seen in this slide. It shows the proportion of the population in each of eight regions that have completed secondary education. It shows observed levels from 1970 up to 2010 and projections up to 2100. Asia and Latin America have improved dramatically over the last 50 years with approximate doubling of education levels. Uh, Africa has been lagging behind, but demographers expect education levels to raise quickly here too over the next decades based on the documentation that children to a large degree receive education at least at the levels of their parents and more strongly so when fertility rates are declining. So, the final slide. Uh, the final slide shows the tremendous change in political institutions over the past 115 years, based on the VDEM dataset that Stefan just introduced, with a slightly different um, coding of uh, regime categories. Today, about half of the countries in the world are democratic, according to this uh, classification. That's a green portion of the graph, which has become white on top, but it should, be, should have been green. Um, only 15% are now clearly non-democratic, the red portion, and the remainder are partly democratic. So just after decolonization 50 years ago, only a quarter were democratic, and 40% clearly non-democratic. So these figures show that there is clearly has been lots of human progress over the past decades, and that this improvement coincides with a strong trend toward more democratic political institutions. So there are several strong arguments implying that democratization has been contributing causally to this improvement. The worst performance in terms of infant mortality rates, for instance, Iraq, Zimbabwe, and North Korea have not been democratic. But rather than making this argument, I'll open up for the panel to discuss related issues, as well as touching upon the challenges that are involved. So, thank you. So, Sabine, welcome. Okay, thank you very much. So, I would like to focus on political institutions because political institutions uh, have a profound impact on our lives. Political institutions, they organize how political power can be used. So democratic political institutions, for example, constrain how much power the executive has, how that power can be used, and they facilitate meaningful political participation. So they limit how much power the government has and how they can use that power over their own populations. And that leads to one of the really bright sides of democracy. Because research has consistently shown that countries with fully democratic political institutions are best at protecting the right to uh, physical integrity. So the right of people to be free from being tortured, being killed, being imprisoned by their own governments. In this graph, I'm showing you the percentage of countries with good human rights records, meaning they generally respect uh, the right to physical integrity, they don't torture, don't kill, uh, by democratic institutions. You can see that right at the top end, almost all countries have good human rights record. If you go just a little bit be da uh, below, sort of having fully entrenched political institutions, this drops quite a bit, and it doesn't actually get much worse for the very authoritarian regimes. And there's a somewhat similar pattern for another type of human right. In this graph, I'm showing the percentage of countries uh, with free media again, by the degree of how much political participation a country has and how constrained the executive is. So if you don't have these types of features of political uh, democratic institutions, you don't have free media. Even some of these countries, uh, like Oman or Qatar, respect human, other basic human rights. But at the top end, almost all of them um, have free media. <coughs> 
Now, free media is essential, really, to the democratic process, so much so that many would say, and as we have seen in VDEM, is that if you don't have a whole range of civil liberties or press freedom, you don't actually qualify as a democracy. But pulling it apart, it's quite interesting and lets us identify how different types of ele how different elements of democracy affect um, how common repression is, for example. In a recent study, we have found that in countries that have just emerged from a civil war, if they have free media, they are much better at protecting basic human rights, even above and beyond democratic institutions. So free media is actually quite effective in protecting people from repression in otherwise quite repressive, volatile and instable, instable um, conditions. But this graph also shows that just having somewhat democratic political institutions isn't good enough, right? That it's not sufficient in protecting people from the power of the government. In fact, if you only focus on elections, for example, leaders could be incentivized or politicians to do almost anything uh, to get votes, which might have negative consequences for society as a whole, for example, by scaremongering or pushing populist agendas, right? S um, this leads me over to uh, what I'd like to mention in my last slide. In a recent study, we've tried to understand why and under what conditions journalists are murdered. Because again, journalists play a crucial role for the whole democratic process to work. And we found that the more democratic some institutions are, the more likely it is that journalists get killed. So the more important popular participation is, the more also local politicians worry about their image, the riskier it gets for journalists. But that relationship crucially depends on the wider context of how democratic this country is. So in this graph, I'm showing the probability of a journalist being killed uh, by degree of electoral democracy at the bottom, but for two different scenarios. One, the bluish one, where judges are held accountable for their wrongdoings, and the light one, where judges are generally not held accountable for their wrongdoings. And you can see that if judges are accountable to what they do, then the risk of journalists being killed is very low and remains constant or independent of how much electoral democracy we have. But if that's not the case, if judges get away uh, with their wrongdoings, then the more electoral democracy we have, the riskier it gets for journalists. And that contributes to this wider picture that just focusing on election isn't enough. It's not sufficient to just have elections or partial elements of democracy to protect basic human rights. In fact, it might even increase the risk of individuals who try and hold individual politicians to account. But if we embed institutions in a wider process, then we can really sort of reap the bright sides of democracy in protecting uh, basic human rights and repression. But of course, the question is still out, in whether it's really very specific institutions like in, uh, strong participation and strong constraints on the executive that avoid repression or reduce the risk, or whether it's other things like maybe free media that usually go together with having fully democratic institutions. Thanks, Sabine, and welcome, Erika. Good morning. I'd like to focus on the question of how people wield power and generate democratic breakthroughs or protect democracy when their political institutions actively exclude them or don't allow them to legally participate in the system. So I want to talk about dissent, and I want to compare two different models of dissent or bottom-up politics, one being nonviolent resistance and the other being violent resistance. So nonviolent resistance or civil resistance is when unarmed people actively confront an oppressive system or oppressive authorities using a variety of different coordinated methods that don't inflict physical or direct harm on their opponents. So these might be a coordinated sequence of methods like protest, 
strikes, boycotts, um, and many hundreds of other forms of economic, political, and social non-cooperation. And they do this in kind of a sequenced way to where they're increasingly uh, mounting disruption against the system and dislocating their opponent from its different sources of power. So violent resistance, of course, is when people do inflict uh, direct physical harm on their opponents in order to sort of wear down their capacity uh, to withstand the challenge. There are, of course, mixed methods of resistance, but I want to focus for today on these two ideal types, which provide us with a number of different stark comparisons. The first thing I'd like to mention in reference to today's topic is that nonviolent resistance has become an increasingly dominant form of dissent, especially since about the 1970s. This chart actually shows um, new onsets of mass nonviolent and violent campaigns that are seeking maximalist goals, meaning they're actively trying to overthrow an incumbent national leader through irregular means, or they are trying to create territorial independence, either through secession, self-determination, the expulsion of a foreign military occupation, or uh, the expulsion of a colonial power. Um, so this chart, in the case of uh, nonviolent resistance, shows cases as diverse as Georgia's Rose Revolution, the recent uprising in Burkina Faso, Romania, East Timor, West Papua, Poland, the Philippines, South Korea, Tunisia, Guatemala, Zambia, Mongolia, South Africa, and many other cases. Um, basically, uh, one of the things that's incredibly striking is the overall substitution of nonviolent resistance as the primary method of change in the past 40 or 50 years. And then another really interesting trend <coughs> is that the campaigns that rely primarily on nonviolent resistance tend to succeed twice as often as their violent counterparts. Now, uh, this is really important for a number of reasons related to today's theme. My colleague Sabina Carey has actually found that when she's evaluated protest and coercion uh, events data, that nonviolent resistance is less likely to evoke um, the worst forms of lethal oppression or repression directly against the protesters than violent dissent. Um, but in recent research with my colleague uh, Evan Perkoski, we found even that, um, that mass killings where um, regimes actually crack down um, and kill at least a thousand unarmed people in episodes of one-sided violence um, are much more common uh, when civil wars or armed insurrections are underway. They're incredibly uncommon against mass nonviolent campaigns, even in highly similar contexts. And I'll discuss a couple of reasons for that in a moment. The second reason it's important is that nonviolent resistance is highly correlated with the eventual emergence of democratic regimes. Um, this slide actually shows a comparison of what happens in different countries five years after one of these major campaigns has ended and whether a country is likely to have broken through in the polity data set to be counted as an advanced democracy that is a plus seven or higher on the polity scale. Um, so of course the, the ill-fated polity data set at this point is what we relied on for this study, but um, others have used VDEM to replicate these results and found that they're quite consistent. But basically what this slide shows and what's very striking is that countries that have experienced a mass nonviolent uprising are some 10 times more likely to emerge as democracies within the next five years. And this is true even when those nonviolent campaigns fail, meaning that often mass disruption creates political opportunities or fissures within the ruling elites that then over time start to manifest through these pacted transitions that Professor Delaporta was mentioning earlier. Another important outcome that's related to these data is that um, nonviolent campaigns are more likely to generate stable outcomes. So the Egyptian uprisings of 2011 and 2013 are in many ways the epitome of, um, of what people think of when they think of mass uprisings today. But in fact, that case is somewhat exceptional. Um, in general, uh, campaigns, uh, countries that have faced nonviolent mass campaigns are about 15% less likely to relapse into civil conflict within a decade afterward. 
So um, I mentioned I would return to this question of why these nonviolent campaigns are so more likely to succeed and are also um, uh, less correlated with mass atrocities, authoritarianism, uh, and civil conflict. And um, it's related in a way to the things that these mass nonviolent campaigns tend to do well that make them succeed in the first place. The first thing they do well is they, uh, and that makes them win, is that they can build and sustain large and diverse participation. So if a campaign is um, openly nonviolent or has expressed a commitment to nonviolent resistance, it tends to elicit the participation of men, women, children, elderly, people with disabilities, and others um, that may be marginalized in the society. And the ability to create those cross-cutting coalitions then activates a number of different political opportunities for these movements that wouldn't exist if it was very homogenous. Um, for example, um, it can allow these movements uh, to begin to pull on the relationships that the participants have with people that reside in the security forces or that are business and economic elites, um, civilian bureaucrats, public intellectuals, state media, and other forms of um, pillars in the society on whose, uh, on whose obedience the power holder relies to maintain power. So in a very concrete example of this, um, in October of 2000, when hundreds of thousands of people had descended on Belgrade to demand that Slobodan Milosevic leave power, um, the security forces refused, when ordered, to use live fire on the demonstrators. And afterward, when journalists and scholars went and interviewed these police and asked them why they refused to shoot, they said things like, I thought I saw my children in the crowd, or I thought I saw the guy who sells me liquor at a discount on Saturdays in the crowd. <laughs> and uh, this demonstrates the power of people power, which is to say very large and diverse coalitions mean that the participants themselves are related in a way to the different arms of state power and that can undermine those arms in key moments that then prove to be decisive. Um, another thing that they do is they use a variety of nonviolent methods. So this simply means that um, successful campaigns don't just use protest day after day after day, but they start to shift between protests and more disruptive methods like strikes. Finally, um, they tend to maintain discipline, even when repression begins to escalate. Movements that are able to stick to their own plan and maneuver around repression are much more likely to remain resilient in the face of it. So with that, uh, I'll simply mention that um, the, the data that we now have access to on uh, the remarkable record of nonviolent resistance, I think is an important and often underappreciated part of the democratization story over the last century. Thank you. Thank you, Erika, and welcome, Carl Henrik. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, to switch focus, uh, talking about whether or not democracy matters for for the stuff that a lot of people uh, truly care about. Food on the table, long and prosperous lives. Um, things that are very tangible and important to, to, to everyday people. So does democracy uh, foster economic and human development of various, various kinds? And this is supposed to be a bright side of democracy panel, so, so I, I guess there is bound to be some positive conclusions, but I'm also going to throw in a few shades of gray and, and be a bit boring and say it, it matters. Uh, uh, according to several several criteria, um, but starting out with the with the theoretical arguments, why would we expect democracy to to be good for for economic development and human development? There are several uh, elaborate arguments, but I think one of the most powerful powerful arguments is a very simple one. So you have political elites, you have politicians, and we must assume that these politicians they're not necessarily altruistic. They don't necessarily care about the populations they, they rule over, but uh, they care about themselves, and they care about being in power. And then you have the masses, you have the populations, uh, who care about food on the table. And the beautiful thing about democracy is that there is a link between the population and, uh, the, uh, and the politicians. 
through elections, through competitions, uh, through competition between parties, the populations will simply vote out of power those that do not uh, provide food on the table. So this, there is this beautiful argument, uh, very simple, linking people to, to, to good outcomes. They will force politicians to, to provide prosperous uh, lives to them. Um, <clears throat> When we look at it empirically, however, when we look at the data, uh, it's not all that clear-cut. Uh, so, um, democracy is indeed associated with several good outcomes. Uh, Stefan showed uh, a slide on infant mortality, Howard uh, showed some slides as well, and I'll, I'll show a new slide on infant mortality. That's one of the features where we see that, that electoral democracy really matters. But there are other uh, aspects where we would assume theoretically that democracy matters, but we don't find any evidence in, in the data, or at least non-robust evidence. Redistribution, for example, uh, not as a clear difference between democracies and, and dictatorships. Um, and so, so, so that's one aspect to keep in mind. It depends on which aspect we look at uh, in terms of development. Uh, but the other thing is that it's, it's really, really hard to identify the effects uh, of democracy. So it goes together, there are several uh, institutions that go together. So how can we separate the effects of democracy from, for example, the capacity of the state institutions, from culture, uh, from, from geography, from other, other things. So that's also going to be a key, key part of, of my talk. Right. So I'm going to focus on, uh, it's difficult to, to identify clear effects of democracy, but I'm going to talk about three, three general points uh, uh, that I think we can uh, take with us from, from this literature, and I'm going to illustrate with some of, some of my own research findings. Uh, the first relates to democracy as a safety net. So although it's not clear whether or not democracy on average is better than dictatorship, it tends to eliminate the worst outcomes. It tends to do fairly well. Uh, no matter what. Uh, the second point relates to, to this, this notion that I've already been, been talking about. It depends on which particular outcome we look at. And the third uh, goes back to, to Stefan's presentation on VDEM. I'm going to show you some VDEM data as well. It depends on which aspect of democracy we're, we're focusing on. So just to, to, to take up this point, so for example, I've been working a lot with, with democracy and economic growth, uh, and there are, uh, I guess, a couple of hundred studies on that now with diverging findings on whether or not there is, in, on average, an effect. But what is very clear from, from that literature, uh, if you look at the studies that look at the variation uh, within regimes, is that uh, some democracies do better than others, uh, so some democracies don't work as we would expect, but when you look at the dictatorships, the variation is enormous. Um, so uh, just to illustrate, so this is uh, the, the skyline of Singapore. Um, so Singapore, uh, uh, perhaps the best example of an authoritarian regime that developed uh, very rapidly economically, even giving rise to the so-called Lee thesis that you need uh, a strong dictatorship to to, to get economic development after the old uh, leader, Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, so this is just to illustrate uh, beautiful skyscrapers in Singapore. Another country that has not been as fortunate uh, under autocracy with, uh, with its economic development is, is current day Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, former Zaire. And here you have two of the uh, leaders uh, of that country during colonial rule and, and, and uh, post-liberation. Uh, Leopold and, and Mobutu. Uh, I'm not going to go into the story uh, of, of Congo, but it's very, very different from the, from the uh, development of Singapore, to, to say the least. Second point, devil is in the details in regards to outcomes. So here is, and this is a, another VDEM paper on, on infant mortality, finding many of the same uh, results that Stefan uh, talked about. Electoral democracy matters for reducing uh, infant mortality rates. And one important aspect here in terms of, of the devil is in the details is, is thinking about the time dimension. So here we're looking at the history of electoral democracy. And, and one key takeaway from the literature is that it takes some time before the positive effects of democratization manifest itself. Here's another outcome, and this is from a, from a recent art article I've done with uh, Siri Anne Dalum, who is now a postdoc at, uh, at the University of Gothenburg, where we look at education quality. So we might believe that, that uh, democracies are better at providing high-quality education. So we find that democracies, they provide education to, to more kids than autocracies do. But when we look at how their students actually perform, what they learn in school, 
there's not much of a difference. So this is the shade of gray in the, in the bright side panel. Uh, education quality, not so strongly related to democracy. Third and finally, and, and we've already seen a lot of slides on, on VDEM. This is uh, just another one. I just wanted to bring this up. This is uh, Brazil separating between free and fair elections and freedom of discussion uh, for men in, in blue. Just to illustrate the point that democracy is a very broad concept. It involves a lot of, can be defined in different ways, it involves a lot of institutions that are, are very different. And it's, it's very plausible to assume that these institutions have very different effects on economic outcomes. Um, so this is just to, to illustrate the importance of, of this entangling. And I'll mention, um, just with a, as a back, background slide, one example from recent research, uh, Sven-Erik Skåning from, from Aarhus University, one of my co-authors on, on this paper is here, and it's also co-authored with John Gehring um, at the University of Texas, Austin. And going back to this relationship between democracy and growth using the VDEM data, what we actually find is that democracy at the local level is much more strongly related to, to economic growth than democracy at, at, the, at the national level, actually. That, it's a very, very robust finding. And thinking about the policies that, that actually drive growth in terms of service provision, education, a lot of the action actually happens at the local level. So being able to discipline your, your local politicians to, to dig wells, uh, to provide high quality education, that really seems to matter for, for overall growth. And then uh, finally, um, this is the Bastille in 1789. Um, of course, you saw the, saw the graph on, on how um, freedom of, of uh, discussion and free and fair elections in Brazil, they tend to move together. This also means that it's hard to separate effects uh, from various democratic institutions. Oops, sorry. Um, so one solution to that is trying to move backwards in time to get as much uh, variation over time as possible, to use all the rich variation from, from modern history. And together with, with Jan Theorel, who is going to be in the next panel, uh, I'm heading a project that extends a lot of the uh, VDEM indicators uh, back in time to 1789. Uh, so here we have this data set is not released yet, but here is just a, a quick glimpse into the, the polyarchy, the electoral democracy measure going back to 1789 for a set of countries from this data set. And I think this will be uh, of key importance to us when we, going forward, try to disentangle the effects of various institutions on things such as economic growth, infant mortality, uh, education, etc. So, thank you. Thank you, Carl Hedrick. So, now I'll invite the panel to react a bit to each other's presentations. I'll, um, and then we'll probably have time for a couple of questions from the audience too. Um, I'll just get our conversation started by noting one thing. So, picking up on, on the presentation on uh, by stuff on that, there's lots of variation in, in democracy. Lots of democracy is a very multi-dimensional thing. There are lots of different aspects of democracy that um, serve to join to define what, what, what democracy is. There are also lots of variation between author authoritarian systems. So, one question is, what, what are the most important, more detailed aspects of democracy or of autocracy, for that sake, that explains um, that explains the outcomes that we are really interested in promoting, such as economic growth, poverty reduction, and also absence of repression, and for that sake, also the what institutions are really important in in allowing nonviolent movements to to succeed and not be taken over by nonviolent movements or be, or be completely repressed. So. Uh, maybe, Colin, you could start a bit on, on which detailed institutions are most important across both democratic and auth authoritarian systems. Thanks. I, I think a lot of people would, would point to the importance of, of, of having a, an impartial, uh, meritocratically recruited uh, bureaucracy, the state administration, the, the quality of that. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's been the focus of a lot of, of research and, and the ability of the state administration to implement policies. But I, I want to focus on, on something different that also comes out from the VDEM data. It's uh, just a lot of um, uh, commercials for the VDEM data today, but um, one key feature, and, and this has also been out there in the literature both, there, there have been two separate literatures on, on parties in democracies and parties in, in 
particularly regime parties in authoritarian regimes. And in some instances, you have strong parties that discipline the, the leader that are well organized, uh, hierarchically organized, and where things are done according to the rule book. Uh, think, for instance, of leadership changes in, in China. And this, uh, in a study on, on economic growth, we, we find that this really, really matters for, for economic growth, both in democratic contexts and in authoritarian. So there are some uh, institutional dimensions that are more or less orthogonal to, to democracy that are, that are key to explaining these, these outcomes. So that would be one uh, party institutionalization, if you like. Okay, so for repression, I think I'm going to pick something else, although I would like to preamble this by saying it really is in the mix. So I, I think just picking one institution and saying that will do the trick, I just don't think it will. So it, it is always the mix. But um, I guess if I had to pick some, I, would, I think what's really important is not uh, popular participation, because I think that can really backfire in the wrong context, um, but rather constraining the executive, um, because the executive <coughs> has uh, the power to use, for example, security forces and how they use it and against whom they can use it and with whom they have to check before they use it. Um, so in terms of repression, uh, I think constraining the executive is quite important. And um, in, a, in a different study, we've shown that if the executive is constrained, then using the military uh, for, for mass murder is much less likely. But if you have a strong executive that's not constrained, then that risk goes in the other way. But a second one I should also mention, and I think it, it, the more I look into this, the more it seems like free media and having really free press and free speech uh, is essential. So it's not something we consider or I have traditionally considered as a, a key democratic institution, but still an element of a liberal democracy that I think is crucial in protecting human rights. Well, you probably won't be surprised to hear me say that I think um, the protection of a robust civil society is probably the most important feature um, in either a democracy or an authoritarian regime to avoid um, the worst outcomes. I think this is consistent with what Professor Lindbergh had presented earlier about the necessity of uh, presence of a civil society and, and, um, and assuring democratic survival. Um, but I do think we need more research on understanding uh, the types of capacities that are necessary for civil societies in order to effectively mobilize, particularly in longer term conflicts where um, sustained coalitions are necessary. Um, I will also mention that in some recent research I've done with Jay Ulfelder, we tried to understand whether nonviolent uprisings were predictable using different structural factors. Um, so it's similar to a question that Professor Delaporta uh, brought up this morning about whether um, there's any ability to sort of observe a latent revolution on the way or whether we'll always be surprised by them. And um, we basically found that they're almost impossible to predict with a lot of accuracy, but there are two features of societies that seem to come out as, as demonstrating at least a, a latent capacity for quick mobilization. The first is a history of strikes um, because strikes are the most disruptive form of non-cooperation economically, and they also demonstrate um, an ability for civil society to organize um, disruptive collective action fairly quickly. And then the second factor is actually a, an increase in repression. Um, an increase in repression tends to motivate people uh, to, um, first of all, become outraged that their polity is slipping away, and secondly, mobilize to defend it. So it's actually, in, in many ways, the reverse of the conventional wisdom. Um, the conventional wisdom is that as societies become more repressive, people resort to nonviolent techniques less. And in fact, it's the opposite. Well, that's, that's one fascinating, one thing which is missing from all the responses is, is the uh, free and free elections, which is, uh, I find a bit striking. <laughs> Um, it was for you to mention. That's for me. Well, I, I, I would perhaps think that free and fair elections are important to support lots of these uh, positive aspects of institutions like strong uh, impartial bureaucracies, strong parties is, is, is ev evidently linked to elections. Um, so what is the role of free and fair elections here? So, so sorry for having under-communicated that, because uh, <laughs> I think for, for many of the outcomes, uh, and, and again, I, I think a lot of good things have been said about the importance of, of packages of institutions and, and uh, 
things mattering in the presence of, of other things, such as checks on the executive, etc. But free and fair elections is, is key to this, this accountability argument, uh, I think, uh, especially when it comes to, to several types of economic policies. I, I think um, holding your, your politicians accountable if, if kids die in rural areas or, or if your kids are not al allowed to go to school is, is crucial. And that's also when, when trying to disaggregate for, for example, for infant mortality, um, this is why the free and fair elections it turns out to be very, very important and far more important, uh, it seems, from the data than several of the other aspects of democracy. So, um, again, I think it depends on, on the outcome you're looking at. If, if it's related to violence, um, I think uh, the checks on the executive uh, it, it is key, but when it comes to, to providing uh, basic services, uh, you can't do without free and fair elections. Uh, I obviously don't want to say that we should stop having free and fair elections. Uh, that's obviously not my intention. Uh, but if you think about it, if you really want to implement free and fair elections, you need a host of other things. So if you want to make sure that those you know, poorer communi communities in maybe away from uh, centers where you vote or they might not have the time to vote because they need to do other important things, um, then you know, how fair is it? Or if you think about, okay, free and fair elections need to be based on an informed electorate. So how can the electorate be informed? Well, inf well you need a, a, a flourishing uh, media, a balanced media, ideally, or a diverse media. Otherwise, you know, how free and fair are the elections? So it, it kind of depends on what you see, what you need in addition to having free and fair elections, where you just have the ability to go and make a tick in the box and that one counts. So picking up on free and, f and active media, what, what's the importance of, of um, new information technology, social media and uh, so forth? That's, that's an alternative media channel to the standard uh, journalist and maybe some of the social media channels are less sensitive to repression and to the, to the dangers that journalists um, are faced with in, in when faced with a repressive government. So. Well, I mean, uh, I think social media, uh, digital technology is a double-edged sword, certainly for the types of movements I study. On the one hand, I think that there was a coordination and communication advantage when these technologies were emerging. Um, at this point, I think basically governments have figured out how to use them to their advantage more so. So I think actually online organizing, per particularly in sort of semi-authoritarian or authoritarian contexts, is much more... Um, uh, it exposes people to much greater risk, actually, um, of surveillance and detection. Um, and I also think that in, in a lot of democracies, it can uh, tend to demobilize the most disruptive forms of contention uh, because they, um, people feel like by sitting in their house, clicking on something, they've, con they've conducted an act of um, resistance. Um, that said, uh, there is research out there conducted by the Carnegie Endowment and other or funded by the Carnegie Endowment and other uh, organizations that shows that um, certainly the number of protest events, for example, has increased um, when people are using Twitter and, and other forms of social media to uh, communicate about them. Um, to me, the, the downside of that is simply that it might routinize or make more common um, the use of protests as opposed to these other forms of more disruptive activity. So um, I think that you know, the, the, the internet has certainly um, created some opportunities, but it's, it's more of a, a characteristic of our time than a cause of, of different types of protest and, and contentious activity. Um, so that's what I would say about it. Well, I think in terms of repression, social media has a great potential in the sense that it's an additional uh, source of information independent of what governments are reporting or that sort of traditional journalists are able to reach. So you get uh, access to a whole lot more of information <coughs> with pictures and everything else. So that's uh, certainly, I think, a good thing. But uh, it also has some dangers. So the one is that Eric already mentioned. <coughs> um, Anita Gordes wrote uh, her PhD on how the government extremely effectively uses uh, the internet to repress better basically, and she uses the example of the Syrian civil war, but I think we see more of that probably in the future. I mean, they're quite tech-savvy as well, those you know, repressive autocrats. But the other um, 
uh, let's say, challenge is that with a growth in social media, it contributes to a disintegration of the media market or a disintegration of the sources of information. So people get now far more sources of information, which means um, they can be far more selective in what they have, which often results to people uh, consuming totally different sources of information, usually the ones that reaffirm already their prejudices or their views or their beliefs, which you know could further lead to disintegrating uh, communities and societies, uh, which is normally not a good thing in the long run. So, are there any questions from the audience? We could so, Budatstein. Um, my name is Boo Rothstein. I'm currently on the run from Oxford University. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, a question to... Can it, uh, I, I agree very much, of course, as you know, when you say that uh, an important asset for creating human welfare is uh, competent, meritocratically recruited civil servants. However, is there a conflict between democratization and this? Because what you seem to see in the world that a newly elected government in a transition political system seem not to be able to resist the temptation of rewarding their supporters with positions in the public sector. And this is a the variation is pretty gigantic if I'm now collecting numbers, you know, if there is a change of government tomorrow in Mexico, 70,000 civil servants have to leave. In Brazil, it's 22,000 in South Africa, 10,000 in Argentina, I think 20,000 in the US, 5,000. Um, and then you come to Europe, there is quite some variation here between Greece and, and the lowest figure we found is Denmark, 26. <laughs> <laughs> and as you know, Denmark is, you know, becoming Denmark. Is so, and it seems, uh, uh, and this is also a question for, for Donatella. I mean, if, if the civil society is mobilizing so much for a transition, the people who are active in the transition, they want rewards. And one thing they want is jobs in the public sector. So how can you handle this, that new governments, when they come in, simply fill the, the public sector with political crumbs. Thanks. Um, this, is, this is one of the key questions, I think, going, going forward once we start collecting these, these data across, across the world and across time on, on both features of, of state administrations and, 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 and democracy. I think, no, there's, there's not an inherent uh, contradiction here. Um, and I think um, the relationship is very complex. It's hard to disentangle. Uh, there are good reasons to think that gradually over time, as you have uh, at least a well-functioning democracy, you may, that may help in building uh, a better state administration. And there are certainly also um, theories suggesting that if you have um, uh, state administrations with, with certain characteristics, democracies will be more stable. In addition, these may interact, right? So, so does it matter whether you have both at the same time or only one? So, so it's, it's a complex question. Um, but I think the tendency to staff, uh, staff the civil service with, uh, or uh, administration with, with your own supporters is also something you observe uh, when regime changes occur going in the other direction, when you have uh, changes between, between autocratic uh, regimes. Now, there are certain autocracies that, that are able to, to stick to meritocratic ways of recruitment, having fairly stable careers, uh, others, others do not. And so, so I think, um, I'll, I'll I'll, I'll, I won't provide any, <laughs> any clear answers uh, to, to Bo, I'm sorry, but, but I, I think disentangling these relationships, I think it, it's super, super interesting. Uh, and I hope to, that uh, several of us can, can work with that going forward. I have a question for the panel and then a short uh, answer to Bo. Um, 
varieties of democracies resonate with varieties of capitalism, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, important in terms of typologies. And I think it is important uh, for all the issues you have addressed that uh, besides the type of uh, freedoms and so on, the, the democratic states and authoritarian states have very different relationship with the market. So that uh, former socialist countries could be as uh, repressive as uh, Pinochet in Chile, but uh, the type of relationship with, uh, between market and the state was a totally different one. And in terms also of non-violence, research by Libby Woods, for instance, said under some type of uh, uh, capitalist exploitation, uh, you cannot have uh, non-violent forms of transitions to democracies. So I was wondering if uh, in your research this uh, um, combination on the side of the independent variables of uh, uh, qualities of democracies and uh, type of varieties of democracies and varieties of capitalism is important. And about both questions, I think that uh, there are also different equilibrium. So if I look at Italy and Germany, you have proports in Germany and you have lottizzazione in Italy. But in Germany, uh, you have an equilibrium between uh, meritocracy and uh, um, political visions. And uh, we can discuss more about this. Thank you. Okay. Good luck to you all. Sure. <clears throat> so it's a great point. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, nobody has yet um, done a study to try to understand the impacts of different forms of capitalism on the, the uh, onset of nonviolent or violent resistance using the data that we now have. Um, I think that uh, that actually sounds like a really interesting and promising project, but one of the things that um, Jay Olfelder and I did was we looked at um, different kinds of economic outputs and economic performance that would be, you know, roughly um, equivalent to different capitalist outcomes. So uh, GDP per capita, economic output, um, infant mortality uh, relative to the global mean, economic shocks, unemployment rates, um, integration into the liberal uh, international um, economy, and so forth. And we found that um, none of those factors significantly predicted the onset of, of nonviolent versus violent resistance um, or the success of them. So in that sense, um, I'm a little dubious that that claim holds over a long period of time and over all the cases that we evaluated, but it's certainly a hypothesis available for further testing. So, so <clears throat> basically, I think that the varieties of capitalism literature has, has not been I think there, there's room for fruitful uh, research there going forward. It, it's not been very well integrated with the uh, democratic survival, uh, democratization literature either. And, and one very uh, pragmatic aspect uh, that I think explains that is, is the typical countries that are being looked at and, and the availability of data. Um, so the varieties of capitalism literature has, uh, starting out with two core models, uh, but focusing on, on, on Western Europe and, and North America, and then gradually expanding to, to some other industrialized countries. Um, and this is where the main data collection and, and, and uh, studies have been, whereas in recent years, most of the action in terms of democracy has, has been in other regions. Um, so I think for, for that to happen, and I think there are several, I think several interesting research questions <laughs> come, come bubbling up when, when you mention that, uh, but I think there would need to be uh, a greater attention to, to longer, longer time series and having clear indicators that would be um, coded not only in, in, in the Western part of the world, but also globally. Uh, I think that also applies to, I think, the repression literature that sort of overall, as, as far as I recall, is <clears throat> that there isn't a clear link between your one type of system being much better than the other, uh, but there hasn't been much research in disaggregating the different types of capitalism. Uh, capitalism. And my hunch would be that uh, what might matter is less how capitalist or communist or whatever you are, but rather like how the, the economic system you have, uh, how that empowers different elements in society to participate in the political process, and different economic systems can do that differently. So I think that would be really interesting to, to find out more about this, and I don't think we, we have much research on that question. I'll supplement that a bit by looking at, I mean, 
I don't have a view on the varieties of capitalism, but just the presence of, of capital, the mobile capital, as there's lots of research showing that um, when there is ample mobile capital, both in terms of um, financial capital, but also in terms of human capital, there are se several of these outcomes that we are interested in that are more easily achieved, such as uh, democratic stability is, is uh, d democracy much more stable where there is lots of human and f uh, movable financial capital. Um, absence of armed conflict is the same, it's much fewer com armed conflict, civil wars in, in uh, rich, capital rich countries. Uh, it also evidence that po democratic political institutions are more effective in reducing the um, amount or the risk of armed conflicts when, where there is mobile, cap mobile capital. And that's probably related to what Sibin just mentioned, that Human capital, mobile capital empowers more societies, m more actors in, in the societies beyond the, those that uh, have political power. So, um. Do you have any other questions for the panel and you? Oh. Any other questions? Okay, Patricia. Just a quick question from the philosopher. So we were speaking about the extrinsic values you get from democracy here. Well-being, economic growth, uh, stability. There seems to be several extrinsic values. And my question is, where we to find tomorrow that democracy does not give the optimal output in these extrinsic values. Would that constitute an, an argument, would that constitute reason to change our allegiances in terms of uh, regime um, towards autocratic forms of government? Or are there intrinsic values to democracy that would trump those extrinsic values? <laughs> oh, the word. <laughs> the word. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, if I may uh, sure. just speak to that. When you were asking the question, it reminded me of Bob Putnam's work um, and just looking at you know, what he argues is making democracy work, but really what is created or prefigured through social capital or in, in his sense, kind of a positive social capital. And he brings up concepts like trust, reciprocity, um, community engagement, a sense of personal efficacy, a sense of um, the ability to, to alter the course of one's own existence, and that these would be sort of the intrinsic values that, not democracy per se, but the, the um, experience of creating democracy through social capital and political engagement creates for people. Um, so, I mean, there, there are manifestations of that, certainly in non-democratic regimes, but um, I think, uh, generally speaking, those would be the values that people are attracted to about um, the ability to freely assemble and gather and talk politics and democracies. So that's uh, <coughs> that's the tough tough question, and 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 the answer often in um, in public would be that I, I don't want to touch <laughs> the, touch the question. I think most <laughs> most democracy researchers, after a couple of beers in the, in the evening, would say we, we would still want to hold on to to the democracy. I guess that's. Um, there are intrinsic values to, to democracy, but, but still there, there are uh, legitimate empirical questions on, uh, on, on these relationships. Now that feeds into the debate, because if democracy tends to go into, um, into other, uh, or produce other good outcomes, then there's not much of a debate, I think, from a normative uh, standpoint. If there are trade-offs, uh, then there will be a debate, and people with, with different uh, inclinations, uh, utilitarians may, for example, answer the question in, in, in one way, they would maybe prioritize food on the table, uh, but, but then there is at least a debate. But then we have a clear, clear view of what the, what the facts are that, on which that debate can be, can be conducted. Yeah. Um, I think the answer to your question is, well, my answer is sort of some sort of standard, somewhat boring social science answer in the sense that it really depends on what you actually mean, because it very much depends on what we mean by democracy, right? Because a lot of the things that you say might be intrinsic values, you could say are actually outputs uh, of having some 
certain sets of institutional features like uh, free speech, uh, freedom of religion, and, and these sorts of things, uh, which, you know, again, the, the freedom of media could be intrinsic, but it could, could also be a result. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's interesting what you mentioned, there could be trade-offs, right? And I think that is always something that might depend on the context, especially if you're, for example, in a transition period, right? How do you deal with uh, former perpetrators of violence, for example? There might be certain trade-offs that you might be willing to accept a certain um, lack of accountability, let's say, or uh, you might accept a more power of the military than you might ideally want in order to have a stable and safe system uh, where you have less repression and you have uh, free and fair and, and meaningful elections. So there could always be trade-off, especially during transitory periods. Okay, thanks. So since um, this is the bright side of the democratization panel, I'll just also respond to this just by reminding you that I, I interpret the panel to thinking that there's lots of extrinsic values of democracy, that they, democracy avoid the worst outcomes, at least at the very minimum, and there's lots of other uh, positive values of democratization. So um, with that, I think I'll um, close this panel and um, we'll give an old bit lunch and we are supposed to reconvene at 13.30 for the second panel on the dark sides of democratization. So we'll get back to these issues. Thank <clears throat> you.